Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where 21st century educators come to share, learn, and be inspired. We believe in the growth mindset, creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration, and strategic uses of education technology. Our mission is to share news and views from teachers who are crushing it in the classroom and making a difference for learners everywhere. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's jump into today's episode. Today, I'm excited to speak with Antonio Vendraman. Antonio is the District Principal of Communicating Student Learning in the Surrey School District of BC, Canada. Antonio describes himself as always failing, always learning. When he's not thinking about learning and assessment, he also loves spending time with his family, hiking, running, and camping. Antonio, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk education? I am. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, and I can't wait to get into this. Why don't you start by just telling us about your current education situation? Sure. Um, well, we uh, we are in the great uh, school district of Surrey in uh, British Columbia. We are the uh, largest school district in in BC uh, by quite a stretch, and one of the bi- biggest jurisdictions um, west of of Ontario, west of Toronto. Uh, super unique, uh, 70,000 plus students, uh, rapid growth. We're possibly going to be opening a school a year for the next, next number of years. I can't tell you how many we're growing, but about a thousand students per year. Um, so that means we're, um, we're growing rapidly, um, lots of development in the area, um, diverse population, uh, all the way from, uh, affluent areas to, uh, learners who are new to the country, hundred plus languages and dialects um so lots of opportunity um for growth um my current teaching position is is actually a a board position i'm like you said district principal of communicating student learning and digital resources prior to that i was a school principal at two schools and an assistant principal and then a teacher before that so i spent my whole career in in surrey and while i've been in the same place the whole time the you know essentially the world around me has changed. So it's continues to provide challenges for me. Fantastic. And yes, absolutely. Uh, that's something that in British Columbia, we hear a lot about the growth of this incredible city. So the landscape, I would imagine, is changing quickly. It certainly is. Tell us about a low moment, Antonio, that you faced in your education career and how you overcame it. Yeah, and this is an interesting question because um, I think, well, I feel, I know I've been really blessed in my career. Um, I was just speaking to someone the other day about how quickly time's passed and Hmm. that I can only recall one year as a school teacher that I, you know, was really experiencing some challenges with with my class and being a new teacher, sometimes you can... um, not have all the answers, right? So, uh, but mm-hmm. but I was commenting to someone a few days ago that there's only been one year of 25 years in education where I've really felt like the year dragged on and I was really looking forward to <laughs> summer. And I, I, I think that that's a blessing, you know, that you can go, to, go mm-hmm. to school every day and love it. And you love it so much that time passes quickly. And the next thing you know, it's the end of the, another school year. Um, so this is a, a bit of a, a challenging question for me because maybe I don't reflect on the low moments, but celebrate more of the high moments. But if I were to say something, it would be a recent experience of actually moving into this position. And that's certainly not because this is not a great position because it is. It's offered me uh, a ton of opportunities to visit schools I've never been to, to work with principals and vice principals and students and teachers at far more many schools than I would ever have the opportunity to. Um, But at the time when I left my position at my last school, it was two years into my appointment. And I would say that um, sort of being encouraged to take this role was actually um, not a low point, but it was a challenging time for me because um, when you spend your whole career in schools around children, uh, and that's something that brings you joy. Suddenly when you're in a district-based position and you you don't have that sort of experience every day, it mm-hmm. took a lot of adjusting for me. Um, and so something that I really learned from that experience is whatever your role is, um, 
that you really have to be purposeful about engaging in the sorts of things that bring you joy because um, you know, a paycheck or a title or all those things are not enough to sustain you. You really right. have to find joy in what you do. And, um, and that, I think that that means like for teachers, it means really kind of focus on it, what you're really passionate about. Cause if you show that passion, then your kids will be passionate about that too. And if it's physical literacy or the arts or mathematics or reading or writing, like whatever your passion is, is uh, spend a lot of time living there because that passion will rub, rub, off, rub off on your students. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's basically what I did, like to get myself sort of through that transition period. It was really to go where I felt most at home, and that is in schools, around teachers, around children, um, mm-hmm. and just really sort of celebrating the, the great learning that takes place across our district. Um, and then forming those new connections that I knew I would have to form in my new role. So um, it was more of a blip on the radar rather than a a low point for me. (laughs) Understood. And yeah, that is excellent advice. I think, like you said, at any stage of the game, we need to be living in places where our true passions are are fulfilled and, and uh, the learning is alive, right? What is it, Antonio, that really excites you about education today? You've got that bird's eye view on the entire district. Uh, You are seeing a lot. What is it that gets you the most excited right now? I think um, I think it's the sh- this new direction that our um, edu- or our curriculum has taken in, in British Columbia. Um, I know that when I was a teacher, I, I really felt this heavy burden of having to cover so many learning outcomes and so many learning outcomes that were um, all about content. It was about knowing stuff. And, right. you know, if, if I've learned anything in my time, both as a student and as a teacher and an administrator is, um, the most successful learners are those who know how to learn, not mm-hmm. those who know the most amount of stuff. Because I've had to unlearn lots of things that I thought were true that <laughs> yeah. now I realize are not. And I think teachers go through that epiphany stage where they look back at things that they used to do, a well-intentioned and well-meaning, and realizing right. now that, boy, I need to unlearn maybe that stuff I learned in that education course 20 years ago, or the thing that I thought was right at the time. So I think, I think this whole shift to a competency based um, curriculum Mm -hmm. uh, has really given teachers freedom. Like I see teachers in classrooms that aren't, they're slowing down, I guess is the most um, important thing that I see happening and Mm -hmm. not this rush to cover curriculum because that, you know, I hear lots of people say that my job is to is to teach a subject or teach curriculum. But at the end of the day, our job is actually to teach children and to build competencies that we know they're going to need to be successful now and in the future. And so this this whole focus on core competencies in British Columbia, the communication, thinking and personal social competencies and then using content to um, to get to those to develop those competencies really shifts the focus to what I think is more important. And that's not that we stuff students with facts and then find out different ways that they can sort of reproduce that and share it back to us, which is our common experience. I think when we were in school, it was really how much content could you absorb? And then uh, given whatever form the teacher was going to give you, could you reproduce that on a quiz, a test, a project? And so I, I just really love that the shift um, a focus to a competency-based curriculum is is now in place in British Columbia. Very well said, sir. And yes, I, I think it's a very progressive model and it's an exciting time to be in education. Outside of education, Antonio, what's another area of passion and learning for you? Um, I really consider myself to be um, sort of a visual person. Like I, um, I notice the intriguing things around me. I think that that is something that as a society, we need to work to get back connected to. I think with screen time and being busy and, and rushing around, we, we sometimes don't see the incredible things that are taking place around us. Mm-hmm. And um, so in my current role, I have to do what I would call a lot of digital storytelling. So um, sort of trying to find evidence of powerful learning, powerful teaching that's taking place. And instead of 
you know, relying on data, which school districts typically have done, is looking at sort of our data for this and our data for that the next year. And are we growing based on this number as opposed to digging into um, powerful stories of learning uh, through the voice of teachers and students? Mm -hmm. And so I've really learned a lot in the last couple of years about um, digital storytelling and um, oddly enough, I've done a lot of that learning from my oldest son, who he actually went to film school and mm. and has taught me a lot about viewpoints and perspectives and how to, yeah, how to interview people and what questions to ask to elicit good responses. And so I really um, have a passion for digital storytelling through video and mm. trying to uncover the stories behind the learning uh, as opposed to just focusing on the data. Um, and I just love, I just love beautiful things. I love capturing them through photography. Um, um, and I, and like I said, I think that we just in general need to spend more time slowing down so that we actually notice those things that are taking place around us. Hmm. Share about a personal habit, Antonio, that contributes to your success. Uh, well, a uh, habit, it's not always a pleasurable habit, but uh, <laughs> I became a runner um, probably about six or seven years ago. Um, I just found in my role, I was a vice principal at the time. And so I actually it probably goes back a little further, but I, I found myself sort of not feeling as good physically and, you know, putting on a little bit of weight and just not, not feeling. I was starting to feel older, I guess the best way to say it. And <laughs> okay. so I just sort of made a commitment to um, let me find something that I'm, it's going to make me feel better. It's going to increase my fitness. And, and um, so then I started running and so have since become an avid runner. I love nature and running on trails and challenging myself. And I spend a lot of time when I run just kind of reflecting. So I get I get some of my best ideas on a run out of the blue when I'm, I'm sort of just processing, you know, what's coming ahead, what happened to me yesterday or today. And um, have even just, even just even mentally written blog posts in my head during hmm. a run. And then when I get home, like, I don't, I don't, I don't blog, you know, religiously or on a timetable. It's just when something strikes me or moves me to write. And uh, there are just some times where I'm on a run for an hour and a half. And by the time I get back, I've just sort of crystallized my thinking around something that's been sort of swirling around in my brain. And so I really feel like taking care of yourself physically is important, but I think taking care of yourself mentally, getting that time just to sort of unpack the goings on of a day or maybe an issue that you're dealing with. So, um, so I would say that personal habit that really contributes to me feeling good about myself and my work would be getting out and running. Well, Antonio, you're getting me motivated to get back out there and start going after my running goals for 2018. So start <laughs> small, that. start small, and go for it. <laughs> exactly. We're getting into some rapid fire recommendations here, Antonio. So you can say as much or as little as you like about sort of why you want to make these recommendations. Sure. But we'll start with, start with Twitter. Twitter, I don't have to tell you, is probably, would you agree, that sort of the number one place to go f to, to build a PLN these days? Um, I would agree. Yeah, I've, mm -hmm. um, when I first, I first signed up for a Twitter account because of some work we were doing in the district, and I, I just did it because everyone said, oh, you should sign up for Twitter. And I really didn't understand mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but it's really pushed my thinking. It's allowed me to share my thinking. And I think some of the most innovative things that I've done at my school um, have really been sort of shared. I've just read a blog post or I read a Twitter feed, a Twitter uh, or a tweet about somebody who's just trying this at their school. And I'm thinking simple but brilliant idea that I didn't ever think of let me try that and so <laughs> I've I've really found it um, a great source of ongoing professional development and um, I know the question was what you know what's what's one leader maybe that you would recommend following and I I did spend a lot of time going through and I you know 
I just don't want to do a disservice <laughs> sure. to anyone. So I've chosen not to name anyone in particular. However, um, I would say that if you're um, a Surrey teacher, and even if you're not a Surrey teacher, our, um, our hashtag of SD36learn is one that if I weren't a Surrey educator, I would be following. And I okay. really wanted to connect with um, people within my district. If I was a Surrey teacher or administrator, I would definitely keep um, keep on that Twitter feed because it's just, or that hashtag, it's just a good way to keep a pulse on the great learning that's taking place in our school district. Very well said. I think uh, that's a, just about the best pitch for Twitter that uh, you'll ever hear. And I appreciate why you, you don't want to name one account because there are so many good ones. We'll certainly drop your account at the end of this. And I know you're, you're dropping um, consistent value bombs for teachers and educators around the district and, and around the world, thanks to the nature of Twitter. So another question for you, Antonio, an ed tech tool. You've talked a little bit about Twitter. Is there something else that you see teachers using in their classrooms that is really exciting you these days? I think... Uh, I'm not going to mention, well, I'll mention Skype in particular, but any video conferencing software, and there's tons out there. Um, we, I just tend to use Skype because it seems to be very universal, um, has just allowed our kids to, especially in a, some of our school communities in Surrey, um, they're quite, um, you know, kids don't have tons of experiences in some of these communities. And for them to be able to connect with schools in Alaska or schools mm. on the East coast of the United States or throughout Canada. And just to be able to collaborate um, with children and with experts from outside of Surrey through that technology it is, is actually quite transformative. And I, that word transformative use of technology gets thrown around a lot, but I like to define it as when we use technology to provide experiences that you couldn't have otherwise Right. And so it doesn't mean replicating, you know, replicating things that you could do without technology, but getting an expert from, say, for example, getting an expert from the um, uh, from Churchill, Manitoba, you know, to do an expedition to view polar bears through video conferencing. To me, that's transformative because we're not bringing the polar bears to Surrey and we're not going to go on a field trip to Manitoba. Right. But, you know, can we connect? students to experiences and to people that they might not otherwise have the opportunity to to me that's transformative so this whole notion of skype and um a zoom all these tools that allow for now like super high quality connections which would have been unheard of like even five years ago with buffering and bandwidth issues and things like that and now it's it's just it works so seamlessly in our sites and we have a great IMS department in our school district who's, who really support technology to make mm -hmm. it invisible. And I think that's the most important thing is going to a school, you, you see two classes doing a mystery Skype, and they just happen to be using technology. But it's actually not about the technology at all. It's about the, the power of connection between um, students and teachers and experts. Moving into books, you must be a reader. That's, I'm sure that just comes with the, the title and the responsibilities. What's one that you've been reading lately or maybe one of your all-time faves that you'd like to recommend? Yeah, um, I, I, I read for pleasure, but my pleasure is usually not like novels or fiction. It tends to be um, education-related things, lots of, lots of blogs, um, but a, a few books in particular, um, one I read re recently called The Invisible Classroom by Kirk Olson. And um, talk, they just talk a lot about mindfulness, wellness, and the connection to neurobiology and, and just things that are going on in the brain that teachers need to understand if they're actually going to have kids ready for learning and in a mindful state. Um, so that's, that's a super book that I think every teacher should read. Um, another book that is probably a classic amongst educators and those in business is Carol Dweck's Mindsets mm -hmm. that I read uh, quite a few years back. And I remember after reading that thinking, uh, boy, I need to change some of the language I use. Right. Um, so I immediately <laughs> came back and just started to like the, the, the phrases that I would use when I was talking to students changed dramatically to attribute it more to 
effort and determination and less on talent, which I think mm-hmm. is super important because, you know, there's, you know, talent is talent and, uh, but work at work ethic and, and perseverance, that's always under your control. You can always control how hard you're going to try, how long you're going to persevere at something. Um, right. Whereas ability might be fixed. There's no limit to how much work you can put towards getting better at something. So, so I think that that's a great book. And I think school leaders really need to read um, The Four Agreements, which is a, a super quick read. And it, it basically looks at the four agreements of the Toltec ancient civilization. And uh, there are four agreements that are the book will tell you are super hard to master. But if you can master them, you'll find joy and, and peace in your work. And so I would highly recommend the four agreements. All right. That is a great top three. Antonio, are you a podcast listener? And if so, recommend one podcast, especially for those commuters that, uh, you know, they've got that daily haul, wherever Mm -hmm. it might be. What would you recommend on the podcast front? Um, Probably if you're a podcast listener, one that you probably listen to already. But if you don't listen to podcasts at all, um, I got turned on to um, uh, Radio Lab quite a few years ago. Right. Um, and Radio Lab just digs into these um, just super intriguing um, and sometimes controversial topics that really sort of make you think about where do you stand on this issue. Um, yeah, just just super intriguing. There's never a theme. It's always sort of these really interesting topics. Um, so I would recommend if you're going to listen to one podcast, of course, this one I'll have to uh, for that <laughs> teachers on fire but but if, uh, something sort of non-education related i would say radio right. lab will get you really thinking tell us about a youtube channel that you enjoy and tell us why you enjoy it and this might be one that you see teachers using or, or maybe one that just amuses you personally uh yeah i i looked at the i had to go to my youtube subscriptions and say what what do i subscribe to um and there's a handful but a really light one that is just sort of you know, we're in the serious business sometimes, like teaching is hard. Um, we are. Teacher can, yeah. Teaching can be heartbreaking too, because mm-hmm. sometimes our students come with with real, um, yeah, heartbreaking stories. And so it's always important to kind of keep your spirits up and it's important to laugh and to smile and to always have a hopeful outlook. And so uh, cute little videos that come on this channel, um, always kind of lift my spirit so i would say the uh, poke my heart um youtube channel which which often has lots of babies and lots of animals (laughs) and puppies and um they're short and you just watch them and you just kind of think that just makes me feel better so (laughs) i would say poke my heart i love it i will add that to our family channel right away get that on the tv and then the very last question antonio just for fun Everybody has those <laughs> evenings that you've got no energy left. Maybe you've just spoken to uh, a conference or something. What are you watching on Netflix right now? Um, well, too many things. <laughs> <laughs> People keep saying, oh, you got to check out this series. And I, can, I can't spread myself too thin. I've got to be all in. Right. Kind of double down and sort of finish it. And that's what all this binge watching, unfortunately, comes from. So, um, I know people are going to say, you know, like you're not a teenager, you shouldn't be watching that series, but I really love Riverdale. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's filmed locally uh, in our area. So I, I do love just that I can point out like, Oh, I know where that's filmed or, or I drove by that when they were filming it. And in fact, that often happens on my runs. I'll actually film and I'll see the film crew and okay. several months later I'll see it on the screen. So that's kind of a cool one that I like to see. Um, something that's a little more mature is um, somebody had mentioned Peaky Blinders. Um, right. And that's just a really, yeah, it's a kind of a cool series to watch. And really any documentary. I just, I just like learning. I, yeah, not just enjoying. I just always find myself wanting to learn about different things. And so I uh, just, uh, any documentary is usually a good one for me. Fantastic. I do think, you know, speaking of the documentaries on Netflix, I do think that's that's almost an underreported aspect of, of how Netflix is changing culture. Just the documentaries, you look at what they offer in the food and nutrition documentaries, for example, 
And I think they're doing a great job, in, at least in that respect, in terms of educating the public. Antonio, this has been fantastic. What is the best way for the listeners to follow you and get to know you a little bit better? Um, well, I um, I am on Twitter. I um, Especially now, I find it really a big responsibility of mine to help connect people, especially within the Surrey School District. We're such a, a big school district and you could work in the south end of the district and never really hear about the great work that's happening in the north and vice versa. And so my, my, I really see my, my role as being a, a connector, like cross-pollinating these ideas that uh, teachers are so busy, they often can't get to pro-D sessions or they can't get to neighboring schools. So if I can sort of bring people's practice and then post that on Twitter and help connect people, then I, mm-hmm. I I think that that's a big part of the job that I do. So um, so I'm on Twitter and my uh, Twitter handle is at Venderman, my last name, but the I is a is a one, so V E N D R A M one N, and um, okay. I use that for my Instagram as well. And then, like I said earlier, when I am so inspired by what I experience <laughs> or or what I see, I'll just jump onto WordPress and I'll. Um, I'll just blog about it. And so my uh, blog address is abvenderman.com. Um, okay. Yeah. And I, uh, again, that's just another way for me to, to share sort of my thinking, what I've learned, and also encourage other people by questions that maybe I ask in my blog. So Fantastic. And I will say to the listeners, if you are interested in checking out those links, I will make sure those appear on teachersonfire.net. So go ahead over to the site and and find out more about what Antonio is all about. Antonio, thank you so much for this. What a fascinating conversation. I, I found myself wanting to ask so many more questions, but I do want to respect your time. So thank you for sharing yours with us. It's been my pleasure, Tim. All right. Take care and enjoy the rest of the year. You too. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Teachers on Fire, where teachers come to share, learn, and be inspired. Please subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review on iTunes, and follow us on Twitter at Teachers on Fire. I'm your host, Tim Cavey, saying goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast.